Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. It feels like romper room. I see Jennifer, I see Diana, I see <laughs> I see Bonnie, I see Laura, I see Stacy, I see Grayson, I see Mary in a bonnet. Mary Chamberlain's wearing her little house clothes, and she is a young lady, and I'm very excited that you're here to talk about all things chicken and ducks and geese and poultry with the expert of all experts. Um, a little bit of housekeeping while we're letting people into the room, um, the Zoom room. Um, everyone will be muted except for myself and Lisa. My co-founder in Modern Prairie, Nicole Hazy, is um, moderating. If you have questions, if you, if you, I, I'm sure everyone's remotely familiar with Zoom. Um, but you can leave a message in the chat if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and leave a message in the chat if you have a question. There's a little hand waving thing on here. Um, and Nicole will hopefully get your question to us at the end. She's moderating. We are um, like you all over the place. Nicole is in California. I am in New York and Lisa is in Maine. Um, and it's... Uh, Hold where I am, I'll say. That storm came through last night and dumped a bunch of ice, but we're good, we're safe, we have power, we're cozy, fire in the wood show, so we're happy. Um, so that's the housekeeping stuff. I don't think I'm missing anything. Um, I think uh, we might as well, let's see, let me just take a peek here. Let's get started. Listen, if you're comfortable, we'd love to see your face. If you're comfortable turning your cameras on, that would be fantastic. Um, would love to see your glorious faces on this beautiful Saturday morning as we talk about these fantastic uh, creatures in our lives. So without any further ado, I'm going to get us rolling. Um, I'm going to introduce my new pal, Lisa Steele. If you do not know Lisa, she is the founder of Fresh Eggs Daily. <laughs> And um, she is an absolute authority and expert on everything poultry. And she has an amazing story to tell of how she got there because she didn't start there just like me. I didn't start in the woods in the Catskills. I was a city girl. And now here I am up here with my chickens. Um, and um, I had the pleasure a few weeks ago of going to Lisa's house and hanging out with Lisa and... Um, the and chicken and ducks and chickens and ducks and it was really fun I had it, it was a great day and it's just gorgeous where she is and um um I came home with some wonderful supplies which are in speed now and I actually was inspired to put together an entire chicken first aid kit which I now have and um I mean I had little bits and pieces but now I have like the complete first aid kit in case anything happens um and so anyway Enough about me and my chickens. I'm going to introduce you now to Lisa Steele, who you guys are going to love. She's just the best. And I'm so excited to say that she's one of my newer friends. And um, I'm so excited for this adventure that we're on as we team up together and move forward with Modern Prairie and Fresh Eggs Daily. Lisa, take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah, this has been, it, it's been super fun. I mean, a lot of people have commented that you don't necessarily make new friends as you get older, or it's harder to make new friends. And Melissa and I, were about the same age. We sort of um, had sort of parallel paths, you know, while she was on Little House on the Prairie, um, you know, living out in the woods with chickens and all that. I was living in central Massachusetts across the street from my grandparents' chicken farm, you know, watching Little House on the Prairie, obviously. Um, when she went off to Hollywood, I went off to Wall Street and was working on Wall Street for a couple of years. So, you know, I feel like our lives kind of paralleled because now we are both kind of living in the woods, raising chickens. Which is, um, I think in life you end up where you belong. And I think I was trying to force something and Melissa probably feels the same way that wasn't really me. And I feel very comfortable where I am now. Um, I love living in the country. I love raising chickens. And, you know, it's easy to burn out when you're in a big city doing all these great, exciting things when you're younger. And when you get a little older, I think you realize that different things matter to you you know, and you just kind of want to step back, take things a little bit slower. And that's exactly what I've done. We got chickens in 2009 during the recession. 
my husband was in the Navy. So we were bouncing around, you know, after I left Wall Street um, and I wasn't really doing much of anything. I was getting bored and I got chickens, started a Facebook page, started a blog and people started asking me questions. And because I had grown up around chickens and also because I'm super obsessive about when I like learn something new or try something new, I read everything I can about it. So I was reading whatever books were out there. I subscribed to all the magazines, took what I knew. My grandmother actually lived to be uh, 99 years old and I would go visit her and talk about the chickens. And like, she loved that because that was such a big part of her life because they did raise chickens as, you know, a living. And, um, you know, I would ask her questions and I wanted to do things more naturally. And I wanted to do things more the way that the old timers did them, you know, like they did on Little House on the Prairie. Um, it's actually kind of funny because when we first got the chickens and I would pour their feed into a little, you know, tray or dish or whatever for them to eat. And my husband said, why are you doing that? In all the John Wayne movies, the woman just walks out with the feed or scratch in her apron and just like, you know, tosses it on the ground for the chickens to scratch at. And I started thinking and I was like, you're right. They probably actually would just prefer it on the ground. <laughs> you know, that's chickens. So it's been a really, really fun journey. And I think meeting Melissa and, and sort of bonding over our shared almost parallel paths, I'd say, has been super fun. I'm so excited that so many people have joined us for this chat. This is not going to be necessarily super like educational, although please ask questions and Nicole will get to as many as she can. But we more just kind of wanted to talk together and just introduce you to both of us, um, her Modern Prairie, My Fresh Eggs Daily, both are or will be really great resources for good information. There's so much information out there right now that did not exist back in 2009, might I add. <laughs> there was not very much information about raising backyard chickens. Um, but now it's almost like there's too much information and there's overload. So we wanted to give you a very, um, I hate to word, use the word safe space, but you know, social media can be nasty and we want to create communities where you can go and know you're getting good, solid advice where no question is too dumb. I mean, I've been asked, like, can chickens eat Oreos? I mean, there literally is no question that is, that is too silly. And, and if you have the question, somebody else probably does too. So that kind of is, is what we're uh, planning to do. And we thought we would kick it off just kind of with an informal chat. That's great. Yep, that's exactly perfect. And we're going to have more events coming up that'll have a little more of a formal structure to them. Um, but um, we're starting off with this because, you know, as we know, there's a big interest. There was a big, big interest in chickens during the pandemic. A lot of people, in fact, I wrote about it in my book, Back to the Prairie. My husband, Tim Busfield, who you people have seen walking around behind me, and I um, have wanted to have chickens in a garden and, you know, our whole lives, we've sort of aspired to be these people, but our lives have been incredibly busy. And every time, like I, I would get ready to do something like this, a job would come and I would have to go on location for six weeks or eight weeks or whatever. And it just, it never worked. So during the pa pandemic, when we were locked down up here at our house in the Catskills, where I am now, we decided this was the time to do it. And also, you know, if you remember back in 2020, there was some questions about the food supply chain and people, I mean, we couldn't find toilet paper. So where were we going to get food? Everybody was kind of worried about that. And so at my birthday in 2020, Tim said, we're going to build a chicken coop and you're going to get your chickens finally. That's your birthday present. And um, lo and behold, I went to, we, we started doing our research, which we'll get into. I'll get into that with you, Lisa. And um, on how to build a chicken coop, where to put a chicken coop, what kind of fencing we need, all the things we needed to keep them safe and all of that. And Tim was looking at that on his computer in this kitchen where I'm sitting. He was at the other end of the table and I was here and I was looking to find baby chicks and there were none. Baby chicks became the toilet paper of the spring summer of COVID. All of a sudden there was no toilet paper and no chicks anywhere in the US and it, everybody was getting chickens. And then I think out of that sprang all of this wealth of information about backyard chickens and how to take care of chickens. And there was wrong. And um, 
is based on, you know, trying to turn a profit or so it's just not a safe, it's not safe out there for people who really want to take care of their chickens the right way. So I had to do some deep dives and really find uh, reputable people to follow and learn from. And Lisa was one of those people. Um, so I'm, I'm so excited now that we have this association. So um, Lisa, tell us about what you've learned from having chickens and how, here's a great question. <laughs> how did, I think, I don't know, how, how did actually getting your first poultry differ from what you, your expectations were, what your imagination could have told you? That's a really good question because I did have chickens as a kid. You know, my grandparents across the street had the big two-story, two-wing chicken barn. The chickens were for eggs and for meat. I mean, I'm sure we ate my grandparents' chickens growing up. I don't remember, but um, it was like a full-scale operation kind of thing, you know. And then we had a small flock. I was in 4-H. You know, we did all that. And as a kid, it was just chores. Our chickens were not nice. We had a rooster that used to chase us. I mean, it was just, it was kind of like a traumatic experience, honestly. And when my husband suggested, you know, we get chickens because I was bored and needed something, you know, <laughs> to get excited about, I wasn't super excited. Like I was like, I've had chickens, not my favorite thing, but I was like, I'm not going to say no, you know, that would be crazy. Like we, we'll get the chickens and I'll work up to like, you know, some other animals, goats and donkeys and whatever else. Um, so we got the baby chicks and it was all on me. Like when you're a kid, we'd get the chicks and we would play with them in the cardboard box and we'd name them and love them. And then as soon as they went outside, we wanted nothing to do with them. But, you know, as the sole caregiver, you actually have to know stuff and you have to research and you have to know how warm they have to stay and for how long. And like you said, how to keep them safe. And so it became this like deep dive learning and not really trial and error, because I don't believe that when you're raising animals, you should leave it to trial and error. Like they're living things. Like if you're gardening, you can do some trial and error, you know, with your tomato plants, but with animals, you kind of, you got to get it right the first try, right? Um, yeah. But it was so different because I spent time with them. I named them, you know, we hand raised them and they have become pets. They're little people. They're just so fun, you know, entertaining, just a completely different experience than having them as a kid. Yeah, same here. And I didn't have them as a kid, but obviously I grew up on a set around chickens um, a lot, but I, 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 the learning curve was pretty steep, but I did a, I, I did a lot of research, um, and was very surprised by a lot of the things I learned, like about their temperature, about probiotics, about wiping their little butts, keeping their vents clean when they're tiny. Um, we, I, that was my morning ritual. We raised the babies when we first got them here in the kitchen in a big, we got a big plastic tub filled with shavings and water and food, and then a little um, Brinzy brooder heater. Mm -hmm. They could climb under if they needed it. And then we, my my husband took the top of the big tub and he cut it open, put chicken wire across, so that I could I could keep them contained. Um, and every morning we had what I would call lovely lady time, where <laughs> I would put on classical music in the kitchen and sit down and clean each little chicken's butt with a cotton ball and olive oil. And that was our lovely lady time. But that we also handled them a ton. And then at the end of the day, we'd have um, peeper play time <laughs> where we'd take them all <laughs> in the living room, put them on a big blanket and just let them hop all over. Sometimes I'd wake up in the morning and Tim would have tucked one in the bed with me. He gets, he'd get up before me and bring a chicken to wake me up. Um, and it was really, it, it was great. But, you know, there was so much that I, I didn't know. And, and just the keeping them safe once they got outside, you know, you assume, I assumed, of course, there's pre hawks and eagles and owls and all those sorts of things. But what I didn't realize is that things can burrow up underneath. There's snakes. So you have to, it has to be, you can't just put a fence up and a shelter and the chickens are fine. You have to go deep and underground. And then we have a bear fence, an electric fence around the outside of the whole thing that we turn on because um, we have a lot of bears. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's a very involved process. You don't just get chickens and that's it. You really, and like you said, Lisa, I agree. They're living things. I mean, I, the first night, one of the chicks, when we first got them just didn't seem right. It was a little floppy. She, I should say, was a little mm -hmm. flat compared to the others. 
And um, it was clear to me that this one was not doing well. I This is my first night, my first time home with the chicks. So all I could think to do was I tried giving it some water with a little probiotics in it. See, maybe that didn't help, but it just was really struggling. So I just picked it up and I, I hugged it into my chest and I just sat there with it watching television and it died. Yeah. And it Which, was, I mean, it happens. Yeah. yeah baby it, chicks. It's so sad. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, there's not a lot you can do. They, no. They're shipped. 99% of the time they're shipped, they're fine. But, you know, if they get chilled during the shipping or one is a little not as strong, you know, there's not a lot you can do with a day old baby chick. They just don't have the resources, the immune system. Really, all you can do is do what you did. It's like hold them, love them, keep them warm. And either they pull through or they don't, you know, it's, that's not really, and the probiotics probably did help. It didn't hurt. <laughs> no, I'm sure it didn't hurt. No, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. I actually felt like right. I, I was, I was lucky to be able to <laughs> hospice this chick actually. Exactly. And just not, you know, so, so they just feel loved like for that moment is really all you can do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then I cry. Been, like that. <laughs> so sad I had another one who grew who had um we called him puffy because he had a big puffy chest turned out that that was not normal and as he grew the more he grew the kind of slower he got and then there was one day where he just didn't look right and same thing and he was still only a few weeks old but something was clearly wrong with his constitution so I brought puffy in same thing within 24 hours I brought puffy in the house mm-hmm. I made a little hospital room in the kitchen in a tub because they were living outside at that time finally and it just didn't, it, it, he, he, again, hospiced another one, but everybody else is, everybody else did fine after that. We've had a couple issues with a fox. We lost a couple of hens to a fox. Um, yeah. So, you know, now we, we watch them with a free range every day. And, um, but in the spring and summer, the foxes are not around right now and the chickens won't come out anyway, cause there's white. Exactly. Right. Right. They're yeah, fox are, fox are horrible and predators in general, you know, I, I'm always learning, you know, I've been doing this for like, what, 14 years now and I'm always learning, but I love when it snows, we have trail cams up, we check the prints in the snow, I'll take pictures of the prints, come in, try to figure out, you know, what's out there, what's lurking, we've, we've read about how to trap various, you know, possums or whatever it is. Um, there is so much out there and pretty much everything either wants to eat chickens or chicks or eggs or carries disease or, you know, you really don't want wild animals. I mean, I spray wolf pee around the, the run. Um, there's a company called Predator Pee and they sell wolf pee. So I spray that around the run because we have bobcat, we have fisher cats, we have coyotes. I have blinking solar predator lights. I mean, you know, it's like Fort Knox because I'm just so paranoid about predators. I get it. And I'm, I'm actually writing a note in my, on my phone right now to buy wolf pee. Okay. <laughs> Who would have thought ever <laughs> time that this would be a thing. Hey, honey, mm-hmm. we gotta buy wolf pee. <laughs> I mean, I swear by it. And I like that it works during the day. Like the solar lights, you know, they work at night. Obviously your chickens are, you know, locked in their coop, but I still, I don't want something even trying to get in. You know, I don't want coyotes circling my, my coop and run at night, you know? So I definitely like to do a perimeter of the wolf pee. And I feel like day or night, it's going to do something. Um, Human urine. Yes. Also is good, but you know, you can buy the wolf pee in like big bottles. (laughs) It's just more convenient to have the spray. I spray, you know, the base of the trees and everything. Um, but yeah, anything you can do. And I also have read a lot about predators, hunting patterns. You know, I know that dusk and dawn are kind of like the, the times when you really want to be careful. Um, you know, different times of year, different predators are worse right now. They're going to have babies to feed. There's not a lot of food sources. So spring is a really bad time for predator attacks because they're just looking for food. You know, usually in the summer, the, they all go back in the woods because there's bunnies and squirrels and all that kind of stuff out there. But yeah, coming up these next couple of months, everything is hungry. And if you make your chickens an easy meal um, and speaking of kind of like bad advice, I watched a video uh, last week or week before on Instagram of a woman who's had chickens for a few months and told people that there's really no need to use one inch or half inch welded wire on your chicken run. Um, she uses two by four like panel wire, panel wire, and that's fine. And 
I mean, I just like, I cringe when I hear that stuff because then people started chiming in saying a bobcat reached in through the wire and pulled out my chickens. Raccoons will reach in, like Melissa said, snakes and rats. You've got to use one inch or smaller weasels. I mean, <laughs> two by four on this your chicken a- run, you might as well not even have a pen. You might yeah. as well just let the chickens out in the yard all day. Yeah, we, we used um, uh, hardware cloth. Mm-hmm. And we actually put the hardware cloth down on the ground first and made it double the, the like uh, we measured it so that it would come halfway up the sides of the actual fencing, which is mm-hmm. um, chicken wire fencing. So we have the hardware cloth on top of that because we didn't want anything to climb up. And then, you know, we, we exactly just, nothing can come up underneath. And um, on top of that, we put uh, gravel and then the coop. And then sand. So nothing's getting up under there. Exactly. Yeah. And chicken wire. I I wish they would change the name because I see so many coops and runs, you know, on social media with chicken wire and chicken wire is useless. A dog, a fox, a raccoon can all just rip right through that. So nobody should be using chicken wire for anything other than like garden. Like you can use it to keep your garden safe from your chickens. Um, but using it on a run or a coop, absolutely not. It's, it's no good. Yeah. That hardware cloth is pretty amazing. It's very difficult to work with though. If any, it's <laughs> so hard. Oh my gosh. Our pans were just ripped up like crazy, but yeah. nothing has gotten into my girls. So that's, that's good. I, that exactly. Makes- and it, it's like a one-time thing. I mean, our run, we built our run eight years ago when we moved here to Maine and it's, it's fine. I mean, nothing has gotten in, nothing is, is rotting or rusting or anything. So it's, it's kind of like a one-time thing. And if you invest that time and energy, you're going to be, I mean, it's heartbreaking for me to hear stories. People email me all the time about losing chickens for whatever reason. And it's just, it's heartbreaking because stuff happens. I mean, we had a fox attack really early on too. I did not realize you know, how bold Fox would be. And they didn't mind our horses and, you know, they just, you know, <laughs> walked around, um, but you learn. Yeah. yeah. But it only took one time for me. I mean, knock on wood, that one time 14 years ago was the only time that a predator has got one of our chickens because I learned my lesson. I have to tell you my, my Fox story really quick. And then I have a question for you. Um, we, something clearly got one of the hens and we didn't know what it was yet because we followed the trail of feathers down into the ferns and into the woods. And um, so we were kind of on high alert to see what it was. And then Tim saw a fox and chased it away. And the next day I saw a fox and all I could think to do is I ran out the yard and I was scream singing the theme from Sanford and Son because red fox popped into my head. So I'm running through the yard going, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. The fox took off. Um, my neighbors must think I'm just bananas, but you know, that's that's how it goes. But it made the fox go away. And so what we did was we altered their free range time because the fox mm-hmm. knew if I go at dusk, they're gonna have, and, and that's when we range them because they go back in. It's just right. easy. And I'm always afraid yeah. of taking off during the day. Um uh, but anyway, we changed the pattern and the fox stopped coming around. So That's yeah. really important. That is really, really important because predators will watch and they'll learn your routine. So if you let your chickens out at two o'clock every afternoon and you put them in, you know, like you said, at dusk, they're going to learn. And I have read that even just moving things around, like put up a step step ladder or move the wheelbarrow or because then when the fox comes back, they're like, oh, wait, something's different. And they almost have to reset. And be like, okay, now we need to learn this new thing. So the more you can change things up, switch things up, move things around, it kind of throws them off their game a little bit, which it can't hurt, right? These are these are hints and tricks and things that I'm so glad that there's a resource where you can see all of it. And you have that resource in Fresh Eggs Daily. So it's all there in one place. Um, because these are the things that that are just so they're small, but they're so immensely helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lisa, uh, when did you get your first duck and why? And cause you know, we're talking about getting some ducks for me and I'm very excited about it. Um, mostly because Lisa says, if you think chickens are fun, ducks are even better. Um, so when did you get your first duck and why? We, so we got that, that, that day in 2009, when my husband said, let's go get chickens. We went to the feed store and we picked out six baby chicks and 
there was a little bin of ducklings and he said, let's get some of those too. And I mean, I love animals. So I was like, yeah, put them in the box. You know, I was like, I know nothing about raising ducks, nothing, nothing at all. So again, it was like a deep dive doing research. There's even less information about ducks than there is about chickens. But I was really fortunate early on to um, kind of like make friends with John Metzer from Metzer Farms, who basically is like the duck whisperer. I mean, they, they're out in California. They supply the ducklings for you know, almost all the hatcheries in the United States. And he is so passionate about his ducks and would gladly answer any questions I had. I got to go out to his place. And I mean, I was in a room with like a hundred thousand ducklings and I really just wanted to like stuff them all into my pockets. They were so cute. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've had them, we've had them together. Like they've, we've had chickens and ducks the entire 14 years. And I have to say, if I could go back in time, I would skip the chickens and just raise the ducks. I mean, I find them hardier, healthier, happier. They're always in good moods. They don't mind the snow. They don't mind the rain. They lay delicious eggs, bigger than chicken eggs, great for baking. Um, with my chickens, I always feel like I'm disappointing them. Like I always feel like they're, <laughs> I feel like they're bored and I feel like I don't have an, I mean, they have a swinging bench. They have hanging treat baskets. They have a dust bath. They have a mirror. They had a xylophone for a while. None of them were musically inclined at all. So that could take it away. Um, but I always feel like I'm disappointing them. And with the ducks, like you literally throw peas into a tub of water and they are happy like for hours. Ducks are so much easier. I actually, I want to address something because I did see a question come through, something come through saying that if a drake, a male duck mates with a chicken, it will kill it. That is one of the biggest myths that I see online about uh, chickens and ducks. We have had, we had a drake. In fact, we just lost him last year, Gregory. He was 12 plus. Um, we had a drake from the beginning. We've had roosters, hens, female ducks, drakes. We have had a drake the entire time and with our chickens in 14 years, he has never touched them. If you have a duck that's trying to mate with your chickens, either A, don't have any female ducks or B, I mean, it, it's just not, it's not something that animals do. Like they don't, you know what I mean? Like, like you're, whatever. Anyway, that's one thing I hear all the time and it's not true. Um, ducks like I, will. I, a turducken is not a biological thing. It's yeah, no, that's a, no, that's a, that's a Southern Thanksgiving stuff, stuff, like right. chicken and exactly. duck, 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 turkey, whatever. Um, our ducks are very mischievous and they will go around and like, like goosing, you know, like when you, you know, goose somebody, they do that to the chicken. They'll go and like bite their butts. Um, Cause that's just what ducks do. They're, they're very mischievous. But as far as actually mating, that's something that people read and repeat and repeat and repeat, and then people believe it. And it just are, it, it makes zero sense. Are you saying there's false information on the internet? <laughs> there is false information on the internet, well, yes. You know what I learned from Lisa? Lisa, you taught me something that I thought was so fascinating because I I mean, I, I, love, I love ducks, always have. Um, it never even occurred to me to have ducks um, and uh, my first question to you was if, when, now I get ducks, when I integrate them in with the chickens, is it the same process? Cause you know, when you put chickens in with chickens, it has, it, you have to keep them there. Right. Cause they want to kill newcomers. Yeah. Right. They want to kill a newcomer. They need to, it takes time to integrate them in unless they're really, really young. And, um, Lisa, what, when you integrate ducks in with the chickens, did I freeze? You did for a moment, if I get your question. Yeah, yeah, so chickens, um, I mean, I had someone email me once and it was so sad. <laughs> they got um, chicks at the feed store, apparently, and they put them in with their chickens because they wanted to add some chickens to their flock. And they just took the baby chicks and put them in with the chickens. And they said, they went back out later and all that was left was like little wings. And they were like, apparently you can't do that. And I mean, stuff like this makes me crazy because like, did you not do any kind of reading or research? Like you can't put baby chicks in with, adult hens. I mean, they need heat, they need different food, whatever. Anyway, but yeah, you can't just take like a new adult. Like if you, Melissa said, I don't like this chicken anymore. I don't have room for her. Will you take her? I can't just take her and put her in with my flock because A, biosecurity, like she could have, you know, something wrong with her that would, she would pass to mine, but also they will kill her. Like chickens hate new flock members. So I never add them until 
they're like eight or 10 weeks old. I mean, so they can kind of hold their own, you know, and, and I like when they're at least on grower feed, because then you can just feed everybody the grower feed and put the calcium out for the layer hens, whatever. Um, that's another good thing. Another, whatever you want to call it, fallacy. When people say add new chickens at night, because then when the chickens wake up in the morning, they think that they were all there the night before. Chickens are not that dumb. Chickens they they recognize up to a hundred different um, flock members, so they absolutely know who was there the night before and who wasn't. I've also read to you can rub all your chickens with dryer sheets because then they all smell the same, so then they can't tell who's new and who's not. And again, it makes zero sense. Chickens really can't smell; like they don't recognize each other by sense of smell. So when you hear something or read something, like just stop for a minute and think if it makes sense. So anyway, there's that. So chickens, you have to keep them side by side, fencing in between, let them get used to each other, blah, blah, blah. So ducks, literally, you can take a duck and put her down and the other ducks say, hey, do you like to swim? And she says, I love to swim. And they say, we have a pool. And she says, awesome. And they all jump in the pool and the ducks are integrated. Like literally that's as easy as it is. I mean, ducks just, they love each other. And you can integrate ducks in with chickens the same way. They don't care. Yeah, the ducks, no, the, the the ducks don't really have a pecking order like chickens do. So I think that's why they don't mind newcomers because they don't like feel like they're losing their spot. You know, I'll notice when my ducks like go off on their excursions, it's almost like they take turns being leader. Like it's not always the same one that's in front, like they switch off. So they don't have any problem. And I think, I think ducks and chickens recognize like the chickens don't see the ducks as a threat to their pecking order. But the ducks are definitely in charge. Like at first I was worried. I mean, ducks have rounded bills. They have webbed feet. They're always smiling. And I'm thinking a duck up against a chicken with the talons and the beak, like this is not gonna work. And the ducks, like they rule the roost. The ducks are definitely in charge. Like if they tell the chickens, like if I put down treats and the ducks want them, those chickens are not getting treats. Interesting. And also- what is the ratio then? Because duck eggs are bigger. So if people have ducks versus chickens and they want to bake with a duck egg, what is the difference in ratio in measurement? I mean, honestly, I'll pick like my smaller duck eggs and use them one for one. Uh, I don't usually have a problem, but two duck eggs equals three chicken eggs. So, you know, you can use that ratio or you can, you know, whisk them and then measure out two ounces per egg which is about what an egg weighs or like three tablespoons. Um, oh, there are so many questions. I see them going by and I just saw one I wanted to answer and now I forget what it was. So I Lisa, I'm, um, there are a few actually, if you don't mind, I wanted to go back through if that's okay. Um, I've been okay. taking notes. Oh yeah, the that's clip fun. the wings, the clip the wings one. That's another thing okay. that makes me crazy is people ask, oh, you know, do you clip your, your geese wings or your duck wings so they don't fly away. Domestic ducks and geese cannot fly. Call ducks and mallards, yes, they can fly. We had a mallard and she never flew away. Like she would fly up and like land on our barn and fly down, whatever. But she knew where her friends were. She knew where her food was. She did not ever fly away. But the other breeds, um, they cannot fly. Their wing to, you know, wingspan ratio to body weight, whatever, they're, they're not getting off the ground. I mean, they can get some air, like, you know, if a dog, God forbid, ran into our yard or a fox, they probably could get up and, you know, whatever, a little bit off the ground, but they can't fly away. So there's absolutely no need to clip. And same with chickens. I don't agree with chick clipping chicken wings either, because if you do clip those chickens wings and they're out free ranging and a fox comes by, they're not going to be able to get up into that tree to get up on a branch to get off the ground. So you're taking away really the one um, thing that they have to protect them from predators. Any other questions? Uh, yes, there are a few actually, if I may. So um, uh, one of our community members asked, what is the advantage of ducks and chickens living together? You only need one coop. <laughs> I mean, I Great. think at one time they did live separately because we had a small coop that I had built in Virginia before we moved to Maine. And then we got more chickens, you know how that happens. And so I needed to like build something else. So I built like a coop out of a lean to and I was gonna move everybody into that. And the ducks decided they wanted to stay behind in the old coop. So for a time they were living separately, which you know they were fine with as well. But the nice thing about ducks is that they sleep on the floor. 
So if you're adding ducks to your flock, you don't necessarily need a bigger coop. Your chickens roost on the bars and your ducks sleep on the floor. So, you know, you could add nine or 10 ducks to your flock of 10 chickens and not need a bigger space for them, which is Great. nice. Lisa, another question is, what is the right time to integrate a young duck with chickens, meaning the age? Is there a specific age or time? I mean, ducks grow so fast. They, I only keep my ducklings on starter feed for two weeks and then move them to grower feed to try to slow down their growth a little bit. So feed wise, you know, you would have to have everybody on the grower feed whenever you have younger uh, birds in there. I mean, ducks get so big. I almost feel like, um, you know, once they're about the size of chickens, once they don't need heat anymore, so they'd have to have their feathers, you know, so I'd say maybe like five or six weeks and depending on where you live and how warm it is and all that kind of stuff. Um, but as long as they don't need heat anymore, they absolutely could go in at probably five or six weeks. It, it's just amazing how quickly they grow. Okay. Um, Kat and um, another community member earlier had asked what types of breeds or, um, or chick of chickens and ducks for the environment. Do you have recommendations around types of chickens or ducks? I do, and honestly, on my blog, I have a list of cold hardy breeds. I have a list of heat tolerant breeds. You know, if you live somewhere where it gets extremely cold, it's probably a good idea to look at some of the breeds that don't have combs. You know, the bigger bodied girls, um, you probably wouldn't want to go with like leggerns that have the huge combs and they're kind of sleek because they're going to have more trouble staying warm. They might get frostbite. Um, and if you live in a hot climate, you are going to want to go with the Mediterranean breeds that do have the large combs, the Andalusians, the leggerns, Penedesencas. Their comb is like a radiator. So it's how they like let heat dissipate from their body. Um, but yeah, I've got two long lists of breeds, but for the most part, almost any chicken could live anywhere in this country. You know, they're, they're pretty adaptable. See, one, one of the things I learned early on, and I just thought was really interesting, was our first winter when we had our chickens. I was sitting in the house thinking, I hope they're okay. It's awful cold out there. I mean, you know, these are my girls. I, I hope they're going to be all right. And I looked outside and a sparrow landed on the deck. And I looked at the sparrow and went, well, if you're out here, then they're fine. Because you're mm -hmm. like of their size. It didn't even occur to me. I was so worried that my chickens might be cold. I forgot that they were birds. They're birds. And honestly, yeah, cold to them, their sweet spot is like 45 to 65 degrees. So they like it a lot cooler than we might, especially people who live in the South. I know, you know, they don't like cold temperatures. So they're cold when it, you know, hits 60 degrees and their chickens are finally breathing a sigh of relief because it's not 90 anymore. I'd say more chickens die from heat stroke or heat exhaustion in the summer than from cold in the winter. Absolutely. Well, we've had some pretty horribly hot summers since I got the girls. And I, I noticed almost immediately the first summer that they were really not doing well, not feeling well. So I started every day, I made them spa water with ice and cucumber and, mm -hmm. all kinds, and berries and all kinds of really liquid, dense fruits and vegetables in ice water that they could cool off with and drink and eat the fruits and stay as hydrated as possible and actually gave them more, um, more fruits and vegetables and less grain in the summer because it, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it just, it felt right. And then I did the research and of course it was right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Another I, I, question from, oh, sorry, Melissa. Another question from Janet is what can be done about chickens roosting and nesting boxes? So your roosts should always be higher than the boxes. Chickens will naturally seek high ground. So you want to make sure your roosts are like at least a foot, you know, higher or so than your nesting boxes. The nesting boxes can be ground level if you want to. And then, you know, the roost higher um, or do like a laddered type roost. So at least the top roosts are higher than your nesting boxes. You can also block the boxes. Um, sometimes I've had some that just want to sleep in the boxes and I just take chicken wire and like put four nails you know, on the corners of my box, take the piece of chicken wire and just stretch it over the boxes like late afternoon once everyone's done laying and just keep them out that way. And, you know, they, chickens like routine. So once they get back into the routine of sleeping on the roofs, that'll take care of that. Great. Another question is, do the ducks free range during the day like the chicks? Will they come back in? Mm -hmm. They do. The ducks, they don't, with the chickens, it's almost like an, a bell goes off. 
you know, no matter where they are in the yard, all of a sudden it's time to return to the coop and they just, boom, hightail it to the coop. The ducks sort of like mosey over and then hover kind of near the door, but not actually in, like the ducks have to be reminded they would happily sleep out in the yard every night if I let them, which obviously I won't let them. Um, but they don't feel that sense of urgency like the chickens do, but they definitely do head back. And then you just have to kind of, you know, remind them they need to be actually all the way inside the coop with the door locked. Great. When there are questions about your best suggestions to keep chickens cool in, in the hot summer. So just like the topic we were having before, do you have any recommendations? Basically what Melissa said, and I would just add electrolytes. Um, electrolytes are super important in the summer. So, you know, if we have a heat, I mean, we do have, kind of have heat waves here in Maine, you know, if we're going to have temperatures like over 90 or 95 degrees for a couple of days, I'll put some electrolytes in their water, which, you know, can help. And there are, like, if you go to your feed store, there are, you know, animal electrolytes. You can use plain Pedialyte if you can't find electrolytes, but, but that can help. But really just what Melissa said, lots of shade lots of cool water, you know, don't chase them, don't stress them, all that kind of stuff. It's just basically what, how we feel in the summer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give me lots of fruit and water and leave me alone. Yeah, watermelon, any kind of melon, cucumber, like you said, all exactly. that kind of stuff. I'm going to move slowly because it's hot, so just don't yeah. bother. Another question is um, from Jill, if getting a few chicks for a broody hen, do I need to move the broody to a separate coop until the chicks are ready to integrate with the flock? I do. I, I don't, um, like if you have one of those little starter coops, you know, that everyone kind of buys to start out and then realizes it's not really going to be great, those little kits. Um, if you have one of those, if you have a dog crate, you know, I like to put like once the chicks hatch, um, I don't want to move her nest while she's sitting, but once the chicks hatch, I'll put her like in a dog crate um, on the floor of the coop so everyone can see her and she can just concentrate on raising the chicks, you know, and then maybe if everyone's out free ranging, I'll open the door of the dog crate and let the, the chicks, you know, go around in the coop um, so they get a little exercise. But I just, I mean, she will protect them, but I feel like she shouldn't be spending her whole day, you know, trying to protect the chicks. But early on, one of our very first hatches, I had them in the dog crate in the coop and I had opened it up and I was giving them feed and water and everything. And I turned around and the mother hen had led like two day old baby chicks out of the coop, down the ramp and into the run where everybody else was. So I couldn't like obviously fit through the little chicken door. I had to like run around and go in to the run the other way. And I was sure that those baby chicks were going to be dead. Like two day old baby chicks in with all my older chickens. And they were just puttering around, scratching, like nobody paid them any mind. You know, they had been born in the coop under the mother hen. Uh, she was ready to, you know, do battle if anyone came too close. And they were fine. But I just, I also don't want to let them out with the others in case one gets like stuck behind something or under something or can't find its way back to the mom. You know, I, I just want to make sure it's a small space for them so she can keep them all under her warm. Plus they're on chick feed. So I don't want to have to put everybody on the chick feed. So for a week or two, at least, I do like to keep them separate. I have a question. One of my hens um, who has since passed actually got broody uh, last year. She, she pulled out a bunch of feathers and she would not get off of, she stopped laying, but she wouldn't get off of everybody else's eggs. So I did as much research as I could. I separated her out. She had to heal because they were they were picking at the pin feathers coming up because I did not know that chickens are cannibals. Um, yep. Very exciting. And she, in fact, she was a white, she was a cream uh, leg bar. And um, I used the, the purple medicine or the mm -hmm. blue medicine. So she was actually purple that summer, um, my, my purple chicken. And I brought her in the house and I put her in a dog crate until her feathers grew back in. Um, and it actually worked out fine. I took her back out, back out but and she reintegrated. She they stopped plucking her feathers. She stopped sitting on everyone else's eggs, but she never laid again. And then um, when I was out of town, I have a wonderful young woman who takes care of our chickens when I'm not around. Savannah. Savannah texted me that she'd gone into the coop to check on them, and uh, Cotton, that was her name, was just dead. So I'm not really sure what happened. Um, or why, and this was over, you know, this happened over a course of six months. Could it have been related to her 
her broodiness or her stopping laying or I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think so. I know that others have said that their chickens just stop laying. They, like they can start laying internally, which means that like the egg never comes out or it ends up in their abdomen or something. So it could have been that she was doing that and then, you know, died from that. But I don't know that the brood, I mean, there are some chickens that are just like perma broody, like they just want to sit on eggs. And like you said, when they start sitting, they stop laying, you know, but that's usually if they just keep going broody over and over again. I mean, genetic stuff happens. I have read that to lose 10% of your flock every year, just from either old age, you know, they can have heart attacks, they can have strokes, they can have genetic things they were born with, like stuff can happen. And that's actually kind of normal, like a human population you know, stuff just sometimes happens. Nicole, you got anything else fun? We do, we have quite a few. Um, so Ceciliana asked, are eggshells enough for calcium supplements? I think they are. I mean, you have to give the chickens layer feed, which has added calcium in it. Um, I put out oyster shells as a backup, you know, like if when everyone starts laying again in the spring and maybe we don't have eggshells yet, they really don't touch them. You know, I feed all the eggshells back to the chickens and they, that oyster shell little container can sit there for the entire year and nobody touches it. Um, chickens know what they need. There's also calcium and weeds and grasses that they're eating, you know, so they know if they're getting enough, how much they need. Another point about that, you do not need to bake the eggshells. There's nothing on those shells that your chickens have not already come in contact with. And you do not need to like pulverize them or powder them. And in fact, you shouldn't. The larger pieces take longer to absorb. So they do absorb more calcium that way. So, you, so I mean, I just like smush them up with my fingers. And if I'm going to feed them right away, I just toss them out to them. If I'm going to dry them, I'm, like I don't need to give them any right that moment. I'll like pull the membrane out just because it's kind of like gross and sticky and whatever. And I'll just like let them air dry on a paper towel and then just crush them up with my fingers. So there's no need to like do this huge complex baking pulverizing eggshell thing. And it's okay to give them the eggshells. They won't, that, that won't give them a taste for their own eggs. I mean, I, if I break an egg, like I, I'll put the eggs in my pocket because, you know, I have a million egg baskets and never remember them. So that if I break an egg, like when I'm in the coop, I'll just toss it right out. I, I do kind of try to toss the egg and then the shell like elsewhere, um, but I'll give them like just the eggshell halves. Our ducks, especially, they're like potato chips to them. They love to crush them up. So my thought is, and this is not proven at all scientifically, but my thought is if you give them what they need, they're not going to go looking for it. So if you're giving them eggshells, and a varied diet and all kinds of treats and free range time, they're not gonna be wandering around saying, I need more calcium, where can I get more calcium from? You know, th they can break eggs by accident possibly and then eat them, but I don't think that they will eat their, I mean, I know they won't because I've been doing this for years and I've never had my chickens start eating their own eggs. Cool. Great. I can't tell you Rachel how many times I've had eggs in my pocket and forgotten and done things like gone sledding. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always having to wash my winter coats because I put eggs in my pockets and then they break and I'm just like, ugh. Yeah, Nicole. Sure, well, that's why we need egg, egg aprons so you know so you know yes. what's in them, right? And we're gonna have um, the egg aprons ever. Coming, well, coming. Um, Rachel asked, are there any foods that are bad for ducks? Yeah, pretty much the same list as chickens. Um, this is this is actually a hot topic too. Anytime I talk about things that are toxic and then people argue and say, you know, my chickens ate that and they didn't die. So it's important to remember toxic does not mean immediately fatal, but toxins can, you know, build up in your body. And sometimes chickens die for no reason, but it could be that there's toxins in their bodies, right? So you want to stay away from the nightshade family, especially the plants. So the tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. Um, I don't give my chickens tomato plants or unripe fruit. I will give them ripe tomatoes, ripe peppers from the garden. Um, but the treats I give them, I give them in moderation, something every afternoon, whether it's kitchen scraps or garden scraps or, you know, grubs or whatever, but they're getting such a wide variety um, so that they're not supposed to eat that. White potatoes also do have a toxin in them, more in the plants and the vines. Avocados are toxic to chickens. The easy way to remember it is don't feed your chickens guacamole. So avocados, tomatoes, onions, lime. If you give them too much citrus, it can lead to soft shelled eggs. Um, 
so those are pretty much the, the food things that I don't give them. And then just common sense, nothing moldy, no alcohol, no chocolate, no tea bags, you know, that kind of stuff that I'm not going to say people wouldn't feed their chickens anyway, because I've seen crazy things. Um, but yeah, there's a very short list of things that chickens shouldn't eat. They'll eat pretty much almost anything and they know, you know, so I won't like if I have leftover stew, say, I won't pick out all the little potato cubes, but I do find that the chickens leave them, you know, or if I give them fruit salad, they won't eat the orange segments. They'll eat, you know, everything else. So they generally know, unless that's the only thing you're feeding them and they're starving, they pretty much know what they should eat and what they shouldn't. Hey, Nicole, before you ask the next question, I'm going to go try and grab a, a guest, um, a surprise guest in from outside. Um, and one more thing before before we go, before this is all over, uh, Nicole and, um, and Lisa, I want to um, at some point unmute our little lady in the bonnet just to have a little chat with yeah. her because- that would Mary, be cute. Nod, nod Mary. Is your name Mary or is it your mom's name on the computer? Just nod if your name is Mary. It's not. It's your mom's name. Yes? Okay. Well, we're going to come back down. I want to talk to you at the very end because I'm digging your outfit. All right. I'm going to let you ask a couple questions and I'll be right back. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Mary had asked, uh, our classroom might incubate chickens. Do you have any tips on incubating? Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to do that, I would definitely read as much as you can. Melissa mentioned Brincy, that she uses the um, their little chick warmer. They have amazing incubators. They also have tons of information on their website as far as how to collect the eggs, how to store them, incubation tips. So I, I think they actually have an incubation manual that I would say print out and then, you know, highlight, star things, memorize, because um, you want to have the best experience for the kids, obviously. Right. Um, another question is, what are a few tips for how often to clean your coop and run? And what about mites? Okay, I've never cleaned my run, like ever. <laughs> it's just dirt. Um, the top, you know, obviously has the, the one inch welded wire over it, but it's, it's open, like three quarters of it is open to the sunlight. It's sunlight is super important. It kills pathogens. UV, UV, ray light, UV rays are an excellent sanitizer. So I don't like completely solid roof covered runs um, because you do need sunlight to get in there. Chickens need vitamin D to lay eggs. We have part of it covered where their food, water, dust, staff is. Um, but I never clean my run. It's just dirt. Sometimes I'll rake the bedding from the coop in there. I'll throw in dried leaves or pine needles. It all decomposes, makes more dirt. So never clean the run. Um, the coop, you know, as needed, your chickens really should only be inside to lay eggs and to sleep. So really under the roosts, you know, will need to be cleaned out. Um, and the rest of it, you know, in the winter, everything's frozen. So I just take a rake and I just flip the straw every day or every other day. So all the frozen poop just like ends up on the bottom and I don't worry about it till spring. Um, you don't need to, you know, clean it all out. It's frozen solid. And in the warm weather, you know, if you smell even the hint of ammonia, you want to clean everything out. Um, but it, it depends on, you know, how big your coop is, how many chickens you have, how, how much they are in the coop. In the summer, they shouldn't be in it during the day at all. You know, this time of year, it's cold or it's snowing, so they go in. Um, but it's definitely as needed and use your nose. You know, if you can smell ammonia, your chickens who are a foot off the ground are definitely smelling it. Make sure you've got nice vents up high. Um, year round, they should be open. So the, you know, the nice cross ventilation, you get lots of air. And one other question before Melissa introduces her, her, her friend there. Um, have you ever had to euthanize a chicken or duck and how? Um, a couple of people have tagged onto that one. Oh, I take that back once. So we had, we had very early on, we had the fox attack, which was awful. It, they killed all of our chickens and ducks, except for three that happened to be in the coop laying eggs. Um, and this was really early on. I mean, I was only like months in, I was ready to give up. I was devastated. It was horrible. It was winter. Two fox actually dug under our barn to get into the run. Um, Cause I didn't think about like fencing in between the barn and the run. So I had to like nurse those three chickens back to health, um, which I did. And it was, 
whatever. And I was going to give up, but I didn't, obviously. Um, so a couple of years later, one of those three chickens started having problems and was walking weird and whatever. So I brought her to the vet and he said she had basically like a pinched nerve from that fox attack that had not healed right. And she started like walking in circles and he said she wasn't going to get better. So we had to make the tough decision. I had the vet do it. I couldn't do it. Um, I think I paid like $90, but I just, I couldn't, I, I, I let the vet do it. So I'm not really a good, um, yeah. <laughs> I've, I'm, I feel you. My son had a pain. Kind of horrible. I so. Oh no, I think she froze. Well, no, I think I'm back. Okay. Yep, you're back. Am I back? You're did back. You, you're back. Did you, did you hear what I said about the mouse? Missed it. We missed oh, it. Oh, my son had a pet mouse and the mouse got some kind of horrible disease and it was just not well. And I actually took the mouse to the vet and had the vet euthanize it because I, I couldn't even kill the mouse. So I spent $90 on a mouse. Yeah. Sometimes you, you just um, gotta know what you got to, what you can do and what you can't. Exactly. Exactly. You guys, let me introduce you. This is Coco Chanel. Um, she actually came to us with cotton, the um, cream leg bar. She is a black French Moran. She has her lovely kind of fluffy, slippery feet here. And she's my girl. She's, she's, um, she's the most personable of my chickens. She comes in the house at the end of every day. She knocks on the door and comes in and gets her blueberries um, or whatever treats she's getting that day. And um, she's the one who will let me hold her the most. The rest are not quite so friendly, but she's a really, really sweet, beautiful chicken. And she lays the most beautiful brown speckled eggs. So this is Coco. Hi. Can you say hi? Yes? <laughs> That's I. Well, so... We've got about three minutes. I know we'll probably do some subsequent workshops collectively. And of course this is being recorded so we can we can default back. Um, Melissa, did you want to um, talk to this beautiful girl, uh, Mary with her bonnet? Yes, just really quickly, I have to. I mean, I can't not acknowledge the fact that there is someone in this chat with a bonnet on. Do you mind unmuting her, Nicole? Of course. There she is, if you can see her. I can see her. She's, oh, oh, there she is. And what is your name? Not Mary. Francis. I'm sorry, say it again. Francis. Francis. Well, it's very nice to meet you. I love your outfit. Thank you. Did someone make that for you? Um, My mom got it on Amazon. Oh, and are you dressed? Who are you dressed as? Laura, Mary, or Carrie? Laura. Of course. That was, that was, <laughs> I, I knew the answer to that question, but I had to ask it. <laughs> Do you have chickens? Yes. What kind of chickens and how many? We have around 26 chickens. <laughs> and we have, my dad, he has a lot of like, a different of like, variety. We, no, my mom has a lot of a big variety of chickens. And then my dad has a couple barred rocks and mainly Rhode Island breads. Fantastic. And do you help take care of the chickens? Yes. That's very nice. That's very good. Does, does, do you earn um, your allowance for helping an allowance for helping with the chickens? No, I like helping with the chickens. Oh, you and I have to have a private conversation. I was going to say, you need to ask for some compensation. Yeah, you should be making at least 50 cents. <laughs> well, I'm sure happy that I got to talk with you, and I'm so glad you joined us today. Did you learn anything that you didn't know before? Well, I, I, I love um, Little House on the Prairie, and I watched your show, and it was really awesome to see you in person. Oh, thank you so and much. And Lisa too. Oh, this is so cool. Well, <laughs> hopefully your um, 
Your folks will keep an eye on the Modern Prairie website and you'll see when we're together again. And if maybe there's other workshops we do that you might want to come be a part of, because I sure would love to see your beautiful face again. <laughs> it was awful nice to meet you, Francis. You too. Well, that made my day. Cute. Totally made my day. Um, before we sign off, I just, again, I'm going to reiterate, we're going to have more events and things with Lisa. This went swimmingly well. I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone who attended today. This is so fantastic. Um, of all the workshops we've done, I think this is our biggest attendance so far. Nicole, am I, is that accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, there's lots of great stuff coming on Modern Prairie um check the events page for events and then coming march 13th right uh march 13th april cornell launch yes all of our new product launches on march 13th and and there'll be some information about lisa and subsequent events and we just we really we feel so fortunate to have met lisa and have learned so much already um she's a wealth of knowledge if you haven't checked out fresh eggs daily you should her cookbook is incredible as well uh, Melissa, do you want to share your favorite recipe from her cookbook? Well, I'm obsessed with eggs in cream. It's so simple, but it's just divine. Absolutely divine. Um, I agree. I love oh, that one too. <laughs> it's so easy. And it's it's it it, it, it it makes perfect sense, of course, because butter is made from cream. So of course you can cook eggs in cream. Um, mm -hmm. And all the recipes are great. The photography is amazing. It's a beautiful cookbook. Lisa, do you have anything coming up that you want to tell people to keep an eye out for? I do not. <laughs> no, okay. just, just same old, same old, you know, um, visit my blog, social media, like follow both of us because hopefully we will be doing more things. Um, and people can email me. I'm not great at seeing all the social media comments, but uh, Fresh Eggs Daily at Gmail. You know, if you had a question we didn't get to that you absolutely need the answer to, I do answer all my email. Um, you know, just trying to get really good information out there. That's awesome. 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 All right. Well, also, there's a, a little adventure ahead this year. I think Lisa and I may be having as I venture forth into the world of duck ownership. Oh, cookbook. Fresh Eggs Daily cookbook. Oh, the Fresh Eggs Daily cookbook. Yes, which we plug, 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 but that's what it looks like. Go get yeah. it. It's and it's on work. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, there's a link on my website. I mean, basically my website has the links to everything, to my social, to, you know, posts, to pretty much everything. So, Fantastic. Um, and yes, we are, we're going to have a, a duck adventure. Um, we're going to have a duck some, adventure this, this summer. I so all of you, thank you so much for coming. I can't wait uh, to see you all again in the future. Check out modernprairie.com. Check out the events page. Our products, new products are coming. Our current products are there. Sign up for our newsletters and emails and things. If you haven't, become a member of our community. And God bless you all. Have the most wonderful weekend. If you've been through this storm that just passed through and is now up in Maine, um, I hope everything yeah. was okay. Um, we, we got it last night here and we're fine. My husband's out digging a little bit. And um, I'm going to go take Coco back to the coop. So you all take care. Stay well. Sending oceans of love. And a special goodbye to Francis, my pal. Lisa, thanks again. <laughs> You're the best. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. everybody. <laughs> Nicole, I'm going to stay on. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. I'm going to leave. If you want to stay on as well, up to you if you want to stay on too. Oh, you know what I was going to ask? Um, 